Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain and we are on day 2146 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue our extended series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 14 of a 43-week series about the good news according to John the Apostle. John has a unique style and narrative as we walk with him through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Thank you, kids. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah, for helping out there. I do appreciate it. All right. Weeks like this help me to realize how much of a structured person I really am. When my schedule goes out the window and it's completely different than what I'm used to, I find it challenging to get everything done as we needed to this week. But I just praise the Lord that he persevered and he's patient with me as I go through these times where I'm not quite as structured and allowing life to go on as it should. And fellowship with family, fellowship with friends are so much more important than a structured work and making sure you got every little detail done. So I do appreciate everyone to be, being here today as we continue our series in the good news according to John the Apostle. Now last week we completed that mock trial of Jesus where he was the defense attorney the last two weeks and he first had six claims of why he was not only the Lord of the Sabbath but also equal with God. And then last week we saw him bringing five character witnesses to back up his claims because the Old Testament law said that on the claims of two or three witnesses it will be established. And that's how Jesus handled it being a defense attorney for that. And today we're transported to a completely different time and place within John's gospel. If you remember, the gospel of John is not chronological in order. He has snapshots that tie into the weaving of how he wanted to present the good news. And we see gaps and we see jumping forwards and sometimes backwards even in his narrative in order to tell the story that John wanted to tell through his good news. And today's passage is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, and it's on pages 1655 and 1656 in the Pew Bible. Now, I'm not going to read it all up front. I'm going to read it as we go through the message, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation because I like the way it flowed um, within this narrative. But keep the passage open as we go throughout the message today, and you can follow along. Sometime after the clash between that mock trial of the religious elite in Jerusalem Jesus returned to Galilee, where it gave him the opportunity to offer to his disciples a divine perspective of earthly challenges. And this is a crucial lesson for the men who later were commissioned in John chapter 20, 21, where he says, again, he said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And this was just a training for the disciples during this time, because sometimes life on earth can be a demoralizing struggle. Some challenges loom more significant than our meager resources can grasp. Some demands far outweigh our ability to meet them. Some answers float high above our intellectual reach. And some problems that we have in life are just too complex for us to solve. Let's face it, this world is huge. And sometimes we feel so small. And to make matters worse, we are naturally predisposed to think just only on this horizontal plane that we live in here on earth. But we have to keep in mind that nothing is impossible with God, yet habitually we think in terms of what we have to offer and what we can accomplish through natural means. Some might call this a lack of faith or a failure to believe, but John the Apostle thought differently. He remembered a time when this small band of men were chosen to believe the Son of God and then left everything they had in this world behind to follow Him. Yet frequently, they struggled to understand what Jesus' words meant, and they repeatedly failed to comprehend what they saw Him doing. Theirs was a completely different problem from the lack of the belief of those Pharisees that we saw in the last couple of weeks weeks 
The disciples failed to understand, but they still believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. The temple officials understood more perfectly even than his disciples who Jesus was claiming to be, and yet they chose to reject him. Disbelief and ignorance are two distinct problems. They're on opposite side of the spectrum. And Jesus handled each one of those accordingly. He condemned the disbelief while patiently transformed the minds of those struggling believers. So let's begin with verses 1 through 3 in John chapter 6. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed the hill and sat down with his disciples around him. Now likely six months has passed between last week's message on this trial and this week's events. Six months. And he traveled that time during in Judea and Galilee, performing miracles and preaching to those that would listen. So we don't have a chronological timeline here, but yet another snapshot, another picture of Jesus' ministry while he was here on earth. As he healed the sick and proclaimed the good news during those six months, multitudes began to follow. In fact, they didn't merely follow him. They relentlessly dogged his every moment. The other gospels tell a little bit more of a complete story of this six months in between that he had just completed an extensive preaching tour with the disciples, allowing them to go out on their own. And when they came back, he knew they needed rest and encouragement, as we're told in Mark chapter 6. So he took them to a secluded place up in the hill, hill country where he thought, well, we can rest and relax. But you know how life is, right? When you think you'll have a chance to rest and relax, things get busy again. Somewhere on the east side of Bethsaida. Now, if you look at your bulletin insert today, I have a map on one of the sides. And you'll see the Sea of Galilee there at the top. And you'll see where Bethsaida is. And also Tiberias was a a city. So they went across the sea and then camped in the hill country on the side, east side of Bethsaida. The Lord knew that the vast majority of people sought him for selfish gains, though, and nothing more. The the crowd found him when he went into the hill country with his disciples, but they sought their own selfish gain. But nevertheless, unlike the disciples, Jesus Christ felt compassion on them, even when they became a nuisance. Now, this snapshot, just to give you a snapshot of what the lesson's covering today, We see that Jesus will feed the multitude of followers somewhere in the hill country, northeast of the Sea of Galilee. And according to the other Gospels, he commanded his disciples then to, after that, to set sail to Capernaum. But unfortunately, a strong wind, most likely from the west, as we're told in Matthew 14, impeded their progress so that the men were straining against their oars just to keep afloat, as we're told in Mark chapter 6. But we go on to verse 4 here, and it's almost like this is out of place. It says, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. But John occasionally includes a time reference in his narrative. In referencing the Passover tells us something about the people's frame of mind at that point in time of the year. And much like if we would begin a story saying, well, Christmas time is just around the corner, people would have a frame of reference there. In this passage, it was like saying, Passover is just around the corner. And a large congregation of Hebrews gathered in the wilderness in a setting similar that reminded them of Moses and that Paschal lamb, the unleavened bread, the wilderness wanderings, the manna, all that would have mingled in their minds with the upcoming Passover. And it would have been present. And that's what their mindset was. Jesus recognized an opportunity and decided to make the most of it to tie it back to what Moses had taught them. If you remember last week, Moses was their prophet. The words he proclaimed, they felt, was directly from God. 
In, the, in a single miraculous sign, though, he would teach his disciples a valuable lesson, clearly define his mission on earth. He would winnow out the multitude for authentic believers and ultimately set his course for Calvary. As we move on to verses 5 and 6, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming up to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we find the where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Now, having retreated no less probably than four miles into the wilderness, Jesus indicated when he saw this crowd coming up the hillside toward them to wake up to his disciples and look around. And this references John chapter 4, verse 35. We're at this well at Samaria where he talked to the woman and he said, the fields are already white with harvest. He's using the same terminology here when he sees this multitude approaching. And according to Matthew, the crowd numbers somewhere around 5,000 men plus their wives and children. In Matthew 14, it says that. And perhaps there was as many as 10,000 or more on the hillside that day. Can you imagine 10,000 people marching up this hillside when you thought you were going to be alone for some secluded time? Upon seeing this multitude, Jesus specifically asked Philip, the disciple, a question. And his purpose was to test all of the disciples here, all of his students. Now, the Greek word parazo means for to test, and this is what was used in this passage, and it has a wide range of meanings that included both positive and negative connotations. Jesus was tempted throughout his ministry, as we're told in Hebrew 2.18 or Hebrews 4.15, most directly by Satan, whom Matthew called the perazon, the tempter, same Greek root word. But the term can also be positive, because in the book of James, we see that faith reaches full maturity through our trials. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 and verse 12, a disposition that agrees with another disciple, or a disciple Peter, when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, the nature of a test depends on the person that's conducting the test. And in this case, Jesus saw an opportunity for his disciples to fail so that he might strengthen them. And when we have failures in life, do we look at that as an opportunity to be strengthened and to learn? Now, Jesus chose Philip to test because based on the narrative that we see Philip in all the Gospels, he was a statistical pessimist of the group. And it's a common problem. Every group has at least one who will take, no matter what you say, have the ability to bring something negative into it. And every group has one, and almost all of us have some Philip within us. Even when something's good, we'll try, maybe not intentionally, but we'll find something negative about it. So Jesus' opening question was earnest, and it was nonetheless intended to reveal a specific attitude within Philip. Of course, Jesus knew what he was going to do which is the critical part of the lesson. But Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And we see here, as so we so often do, when the Bible is clear, we come back with a completely different question or answer. Philip didn't answer the question that Jesus said. Jesus said, where can we buy bread? He didn't ask, could we? He said, where? But Philip says, there's no way we can buy that much bread. How much? The word money here, translated in the New Living Translation, actually refers to 200 denarii. And a denarius was a Roman silver coin, and it was re roughly equal to one day's wages for a semi-skilled laborer. So he quickly estimated, Philip did, that the power of 200 shekels, or 200 days' wages, was perhaps the amount that was in their treasury of the disciples. It's thought by some commentaries or commentators that they had maybe six months' worth of wages in among all the disciples' treasury. 
So the amount was considerable, but it was paltry compared to the need because Philip was saying, if we just gave people just a wee little bit of food, a wee little bit of bread, we would need six months worth of wages just to provide a wee little bit of bread for them. So Philip looked at the problems in terms of meeting that minimum requirement if just a little bit for each person was impossible, and abundance was not even worth considering. And statistical pessimists are that way. So while we can't even give them a little bit, there's no way we're going to give them a lot. And Philip looked at it that way. But if we go on to verse 8 and 9, it says, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There is a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? While Philip calculated the cost, Andrew moved quietly throughout the crowd. While Philip looked for something beyond their means, Andrew considered the possibility that the people might provide for themselves with a bit of leadership, but the people had little or nothing. They didn't bring provisions with him up into the whole country. So he sheepishly mentioned one little boy sack lunch. And he says, well, I found five barley loaves and two fishes here. But that's not going to do much for us. So everything about Andrew's statement emphasizes the inadequacy of what he found in the crowd. And the Greek term here even for boy was a double diminutive. It means a little boy. Not a teenager, but a little boy. In terms of provision, the little children were usually no use of all. A few barley loaves were common in the Mediterranean diet. They would have been a little piece of bread, little loaf. And I was fresh out of barley loaves at home. So the closest I could come to it was a pack of tortillas. The barley loaves were four to five inches in diameter. And they were slightly raised, probably raised more than this, but not very, very big loaf at all. So he says, these are five of these tortillas that we found, but what's that for such a huge crowd? And then he says, well, this little boy also had two fish. So I brought some sardines along. I won't open them. I made this mistake back in... When we had um, vacation Bible school one day, I, as a skit, I was cooking sardines. So almost I made the pianist sick because of the smell. But it would be similar to these type of fish that this little boy would have in his lunch, bu- lunch bag. A few, five barley loaves and two small fishes. And you're going to feed 10,000 people with them? That's not possible. And the sardine-like fish were provided for taste because just like a tortilla, would anyone want to eat just a tortilla by itself? That would be worse than, I shouldn't say this, but the communion wafers. (laughs) (laughs) Eating a barley loaf by itself would be just almost impossible. So they rolled them up. They had a a fish taco to give it some flavor, and then that's how they would eat their meal, a few fish and some barley loaves. Well, it harkened back to a similar experience that Elijah had in 2 Kings, but the proportions today are way out of whack compared to even that, because Elijah in 2 Kings, they had 20 loaves of bread, but they had 100 people to split it among. And similar to this, They said, it'll be an adequate food to feed everybody. And we're referring back to that. And while Andrew faithfully reported the provisions he had found, his final comment revealed his limited perspective. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus was not discouraged by their responses, though, because he knew what he was going to do. So he continued his plan like he didn't even hear what they had said. He went on in verse 10 and 11. He says, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he, he did the same with the fish. And all they all ate as much as they wanted. I can imagine 
the Lord flashing sort of a reassuring grin, to their lack of faith as he instructed the disciples, just tell the people to sit down. I got this. Don't worry about it. Then in the vernacular of the day, he said, have the people recline because in the Middle East, and even today, Buddy was in Middle East and Iraq a couple times in, in military service, and when they go to eat, they don't sit in chairs at a table. They recline, and then they eat as they were reclined. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples to do. Tell the people, gather them in groups of 50 and recline on the ground because I'm going to feed them. Imagine the scene. The disciples organized the people into groups, as we're told in Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9, and he instructed them to prepare for a meal. But no one saw any food. There was none to be had, except for the five barley loaves and two small fish. And the disciples had no idea how the people were going to be fed. But once they were organized, and Jesus Christ was very organized in his, his approach, once they were organized and it was complete, the Lord placed the sack lunch in front of him and says, now watch and see what I'm going to do. He tells them that he will take care of it. Imagine the disciples, though, they're giving sideway glances to each other saying, what's he up to now? How we're going to feed all these fish? He had just had to sit down, or all these people, he's had to sit down and have everyone sit down. Now what? But the Lord took that and said, thank you, Father, for this food that this large gathering is going to enjoy. And Jesus began to multiply that meager offering. Imagine the scene again as he broke the lunch into two, but every time he split the loaf and passed it out, he could split it again and again and again, over and over, until 10,000 people had all the food they wanted, all the fish they wanted, all the bread they wanted, until they were completely satisfied. At the end of the day, disciples' lesson should have been clear. The size of the challenge should never be gauged by in terms of our own capability. What we have to offer will never be enough. God will always provide. That's his responsibility. All he calls us to do is be faithful with what he tells us to do. He calls us to commit whatever we have, whether it's little or much, like the, the sack of food. Wasn't much, but was enough. And that's what he calls for us to do. We don't have much, or maybe we have much, but whatever we have, he can use it. He, come, he calls his call comes with a purpose. He says, you take care of the addition. You take care of the things that you're responsible for, and I'll take care of the multiplication. I'll take care of the mission. I've invited you to join me as we accomplish this. As we move on to verses 14 and 15, it says, when the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet that we have been expecting. And when Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Jesus knew what they had in mind. It wasn't his time yet. So he goes back up in the hill away from them. John's comment briefly on the response of the people, which is essential to our story later on, because Jesus knew their hearts. The Lord performed this sign to instruct the people as well as his disciples. There in the wilderness, having consumed that miracle bread, to their stomach's delight, they recognized him as possibly the prophet. And that prophet that we're speaking of is what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. He says, a prophet will come who will be greater than I. And also John chapter 1, verse 21, they asked John the baptizer, are you the prophet? He says, I am not. Before he proclaimed, look, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Jesus rejected the path of, that most earthly kings would have taken and allowed them to be king. He refused to ride that swell of popular support in Jerusalem because he knew that his path was the way of suffering, that he had been, that had been prophesied for centuries and planned from the very beginning by the Father, as we're told in John chapter 18, verse 36. 
Moreover, Jesus knew that their stomachs, rather than their hearts, were prompting these people to make him king. Therefore, Jesus chose to not to address the crowd immediately. His time had not yet come. Instead, he retreated further into the wilderness hill country. As we move on to verses 16 through 18, it said, That evening Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across toward Capernaum. And soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. What we see as the evening fell, the crowd dispersed. They went back to their homes, and the disciples boarded a fishing boat for Capernaum. And we don't get the complete story in John's narrative, but in Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 6 tells them that the Lord instructed them to go toward Capernaum. And they waited around a while for Jesus, and he didn't show up. So he says, well, we're going to go ahead anyway. And so often in our lives, we don't wait long enough for Jesus to work in our lives. We take off in the boat on our own, and more often than not, it will bring us into the choppy waves. But Jesus perceived he was in the hill country by himself, and he perceived the struggle that they were having, supernaturally, no doubt, as we see in Mark chapter 6. And he saw them struggling to stay afloat on the course in those wee hours of the morning, as Matthew chapter 14 tells us. A fierce squall descended into the sea because the Sea of Galilee was between the Arabian Desert and the Mediterranean Sea and was 686 feet below sea level. And there was a deep, deep rift, and the winds would whip in from the west, and it would cause the Sea of Galilee and the waves to roll on that sea and became very choppy, one which would be a nightmare for the crude ships of that first century. And even today, I read a commentator who notes that in similar situation, power boats of today are warned to remain docked when the winds whip up the Sea of Galilee into these frothy, foamy white caps. As we move on to 19 through 21 in this passage, it says, they had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified. But he called out to them, don't be afraid, I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination in Capernaum. Now the men put all their strengths against the, ro the oars to make landfall in Capernaum, but the winds resisted them for hours. And there's another vivid example of human inadequacy. We row and row and row against those waves when all we have to do is trust in Jesus to work it out for us. It's another vivid example of human inadequacy. By contrast, Jesus demonstrated mastery over the elements by walking across the water to rescue them. And when Jesus reached the boat, he calmed the disciples by saying the Greek word, if I say this right, ego, emi, which means I am. And that was preceded by a command that he gave them, don't be afraid, I am, the great I am, is here. And he stepped into the vessel, and immediately, it's like one of those Star Trek stories, they were transported to Capernaum. They reached their destination. John offers this without any explanation. He would say, John, give me more details. But presumably, the point should have been clear to them. Once again, he brought his abundant power, Jesus did, to rescue human inadequacy, turning the impossible situation into the opportunity to strengthen the confidence of believers. The disciples should have been commended, should be commended for their trust in the Lord, despite their still dull minds. What had happened just a few hours prior to that? However, while their minds were dull, they still continued to trust Jesus, yet they tragically failed to gain that sign, believe that sign from a few hours ago that 10,000 people were fed. If the Lord can do that. What else can he do in our lives? But more, according to Mark chapter 6, verse 52, their hearts were too hard to take it in. The idiom didn't mean that he, they were unkind or uncruel when they said they were dull-minded as it does in, might in the English. Instead, 
Their reasoning and emotions were resistant to the developments that were happening. We would say that they were thick-headed. Nevertheless, Jesus remained patient with his disciples. If he rebuked them at all, it was always with a gentle manner. The people who had, had been fed in the wilderness were also thick-headed, but for an entirely different reason. Because upon landing in Capernaum, all the people that were fed before rushed over to where he was. And Jesus had to confront their selfish motives head on once again. And we'll look at that in next week's lesson. But what's the application of John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21? It boils down to the miracle math that we see in this passage. Philip faced a math problem that he couldn't solve one day in the spring in that region of Galilee. Jesus looked down the slope and saw of the mountain and saw a multitude of empty stomachs. Immediately, he charged Philip with a task on feeding them. The poor disciples didn't need a calculator to figure out the natural solution just wouldn't work in this case. In fact, a quick estimate gave proof to Jesus to challenge that could not be met with even what they had on hand. Say the disciples in their treasury had 200 days worth of wages. Philip quickly calculated, even if we spent everything we had and went and bought bread, if that was possible, they were out in the wilderness, so it wasn't. Even if they spent everything they had, all they could do is give a little morsel to every person there. Sooner or later, every believer, each one of us, is faced with mathematics that would say, that's impossible to happen. But how should we respond? Now I observed Philip, Andrew, the other disciples, this little boy with his lunch, and Jesus himself. I find a model, to, a model of faithful obedience that's worth emulating. Consider the following steps. The next time you have a mouth problem, challenge you, about, challenge you about the work of God. And if you look at your bulletin insert on the other side, I have four steps that we can take. First, acknowledge your inadequacy and the Lord's omnipotence. Perhaps Philip could have responded to Jesus directly by saying, Lord, we don't have the ability to accomplish what you've asked us to, but nothing is too difficult for you. Now, that's not a form of shrinking from a challenge or shirking our responsibility. There's nothing ungodly about acknowledging the size of the challenge and understanding that we are not adequate to handle that challenge ourselves. We need to only remember the Lord's power is always greater, no matter what our difficulties that we face. Second, be certain that the challenge before you glorifies the Lord, obeys the commands of Scripture, and helps you to fulfill that scriptural mandate such as a great commission. The Lord never challenged his disciples to demoralize them. The impossible task that he gave to Philip and it was impossible, but it did have a solution, albeit a supernatural one. And at the same time, it's true with us. Jesus issues a command before ascending to take the place in glory. He issued each one of us a command. And that command is Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He says, make disciples of all nations. That's what we're to do. Humanly speaking, this is an impossible task. He might as well ask us to dip the Pacific Ocean completely dry with a teaspoon. It can't be done. How can we make disciples of all nations? Nevertheless, he commanded us something, and it can be done supernaturally. Just think of today's world. 2,000 years later, we have billions of Christ followers across the world in every tribe and every nation. And it started with 12 men who faithfully followed, well, 11 of those 12, faithfully followed Jesus Christ. With his command, he says, make disciples of all nations. And today we see that evidence. More than ever before, people have access to God's word through electronic means, through other translations, that there's rarely, or probably very few places in the world that don't have the opportunity now to have scripture in their own hands. Impossible, you say, but it wasn't. Today's difficulty is that we generally don't receive personal commands from the Lord. We say, well, Lord, if you just give me a sign, 
If you just give me a dream at night, or better let yet, why don't you send me something FedEx so I know what your plans are for us? You might say, well, what type of outreach program would be most effective for our community in the world? It would be easier if Christ gave us his command and sent them to directly to us. But he's already done that. He gave us, gave us everything that we need, and it's found in scriptures. We don't need additional commands to do what he says. If we work together and keep one another honest, we can put his plans to the test. We can ask, does that challenge glorify God? Does the challenge obey the commands of Scripture? Does the challenge fulfill the scriptural mandate? Because remember, as we talked about even clear back in the Sermon on the Mount series last year, about this, as we started about this time, our occupation in this world is to build God's kingdom as citizens of his kingdom. What we do for a living is a means to that end. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. Our occupation is to build God's kingdom. And if you do it to his glory, then it's just as important in any other occupation that you could have. The third is to give the challenge back to the Lord as an opportunity for him to accomplish it on his behalf or on your behalf and to receive glory from you for the victory. The Lord delights in achieving the impossible on our behalf, sharing the spoils of the victory, allowing us to see the fruits of that, especially if that triumph results in our obedience to him and the obedience of others. How much pleasure Jesus would have received if Philip would have just said, Lord, this is far more than I can handle, but nothing is too difficult for you. How will you feed this multitude? And fourth, do what you can, supply what you have, put forward, forth your, forward your effort, then allow the Lord to multiply it or not at his discretion. And although the Lord could have materialized this food out of thin air, he chose to use the limited supply that was available that day to perform his miracle. He used a meager, unassuming lunch of an inconspicuous little boy that will never know who it was, and he multiplied it. Jesus doesn't really need our help. He can do anything and everything himself. Nevertheless, he calls us to do his part, not for his sake, but for ours. He invites us to become part of his plan so he can have a means of grace to work through us so that the victory is won and then the glory goes back to him because it's not of our strength, it's through Jesus Christ. Then we can say we've triumphed through Jesus Christ. And by the end of the day, as the disciples gathered the food surplus, the solution to this mathematical problem was obvious. Jesus said, in effect, you do the addition, you do what you can with what you have. That's all I'm asking of you. I'm not asking you to do heroic feats. I'll take care of the multiplication, and everything I've commanded you will be accomplished with plenty left over. Twelve baskets full left over. And the basket full was, we would think of it more of a backpack, and it would be larger than this, but they had these wicker totes that they carried, usually something like this, and it would be two to three days' worth of provisions that they would carry along with them. And they had enough provisions for 12 disciples to carry with them for the next two to three days after he had fed over 10,000 people. Everything they wanted, completely full, stuffed to the, to the gills, as we used to say, he would do that. There was plenty left over. It reminds me of growing up, because in the Middle Eastern, first century Middle Eastern, there were not a lot of leftovers at a person's home. And it reminds me of growing up in a family of 12. My, there are 10 of us kids and my parents. Mom would usually have something on a serving plate and pass it around the table. We would take off a portion and pass it on all around the table. That's how we served our dinners. I can think of unlimited number of times where it didn't get all the way around before it ran out of food. And mom would say, pass the plate back. And we'd have to put some back so they can make it all the way around. We very rarely had leftovers in our family. 
but we were always provided for. In the same way, Jesus Christ here not only provided, but there was leftovers in abundance. And yet, we see in our message next week that that wasn't enough to satisfy these 10,000 people. They were back shortly after that for another free meal. But instead of a meal Jesus will teach them next week, we'll look at the bread that was delivered from heaven. So I'd ask you to read John chapter 6, verses 22 through 71 in preparation for next week's message. And keep in mind, God is the God of the impossible. All we, he asks us is use our meager resources to do what we can, and he will multiply those into something great. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for the resources you provide us. And in this country we live in, we're so blessed. We have so much. We take it for granted so often. Forgive us for the sin of not being great, more grateful for what you provide to us. Help us to use the meager resources that you've given us, Father, for your honor and glory. Help us to be about building God's kingdom in this world. Help us to be about proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, helping those that are in need of help, ministering where we can minister, and allowing you to take our meager efforts and multiply them around the world, Father. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.